there's a Jalen Brown conversation that's kind of brewing. It's not a bad thing. There's nobody like taking sides. It's it's not damaging in any way yet, but it's just been an interesting subplot to an 11 and three Celtics season, especially considering he signed for $304 million extension last summer. Um, I got I got this tweet forwarded me to a bunch of times today. And it was from somebody whose Twitter name is RYB underscore 311. And he said, Jalen Brown got it better than anyone. Super max money. If the team loses, it's Tatum's fault. Lowest expectations of any all-star. No one even cares when he plays like shit outside the playoffs. Not expected to play make. Not expected to guard the first, second, or third option. Multiple people in my life sent me this text, including people who aren't Boston fans. Because I think people want there to be a Jalen Brown conversation because he got all this money. It's like, oh, this is, there's going to be a Jalen thing. At the same time, I am on a lot of texts like, God damn it, what the hell is going on with Jalen Brown? Is is it panic time yet? Where are we with this? Well, RYB underscore 11 spot on, right? I mean, he is. Like, that is a spot on tweet. Um, I mean, I, I think with Jalen Brown, Bill, like, I think with him, the conversation, it, it, how much is really different, right? Like, the sloppy ball handling that's nothing new. We, we saw him have as many turnovers as he did shots in a finals game against the Warriors. We saw him do it again against the Heat in Game 7 last year when he had eight turnovers, eight made shots. The four shots aren't anything new. I think what's changed with the way we're perceiving Jalen Brown is the fact that now with Boston, they have Chris Tapp's Porzingis. And with Porzingis, he's shooting 11.9 times per game to 17.8 for Jalen. So even though Jalen is sacrificing a little bit, he was at 19, 20 shots per game the last three seasons. Now you have him who is, let's just be real, he's, he's inefficient in the half court compared to some of his all-star peers. And now you have him with Chris Tapps Porzingis, who has a 67% true shooting this year. Jalen Brown is at 54% true shooting. So you, he's he's in this situation where his role is effectively the same as it's been in recent years, just a, a little bit, you know, fewer shots per game. When Porzingis, meanwhile, is been amazing. He looks like he should be the second option or should at least close the gap with Brown. So I think that's where... It, not much has changed other than the other guy on the team that should be getting more shots than Chris Epps, Porzingis. Yeah, I mean, you could argue Porzingis should be the second option and really Derek White or Drew Holiday destroying whoever, whoever the weak defensive guard is on the other team and putting that guard in a pick and roll and running it with anybody else in the team. That could be the third option. It, it's weird to say this because Jalen's in an incredible situation. This is probably the most talented team in the league. I think them and Denver are the are the two favorites right now still. Murray will come back at some point. And Jalen's in an awesome spot for a lot of the reasons laid out in that tweet, right? It's it's all, anything he does is additive, positive, if he's playing well, doing well, all that stuff. I just wonder if this is a great situation for him because you could say he's the fifth most valuable guy in this team. Doesn't mean he's the fifth best player. But you saw like when White is in White, they lose to Charlotte on Monday night. White's not in the game. They're one and two without White. They're 10 and one with White, including the one loss was that Philly game. That was pretty close. They lost by three and it came down to uh, the last play. Um, poor Zingas, the stuff that he's brought to the Celtics has been um, honestly way better than I think any of us ever expected. He seems super happy. He's an, a, a really, 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 really good offensive player. I have no idea how long he's going to stay healthy. I, I think every game with Porzingis is a knock on wood. And it's like at some point he'll probably get hurt for three weeks. Like I'm just factoring that in. Tatum, I think, has been maybe 2% better than he was last year. And the White Holiday combo are great. So J whatever Jalen brings to the table is is basically a bonus. But this is also a guy who's taken 18 shots a game who's taken a few times the biggest shot of a game, whether you wanted to, him to or not. And that's the little tug of war. I mentioned this two weeks ago after that Minnesota game. They get a stop, get the ball 10 seconds left. Missoula should have called a timeout. He didn't. Jalen had the ball at half court. He had, I think, McDaniels on. It might have been Edwards. It was one of the two. And it was just became clear. It was like, oh, we're headed toward a hero ball, Jalen three. And it's like, his odds just aren't good on this. They're, he's going against an awesome defender. And I am not confident he's going to make this. He misses it. Then it goes to overtime. I, the question for me, KOC, is 
how much does he have to sacrifice? How much does he think he has to sacrifice? And does he want to sacrifice for this team to ult- ultimately reach its destiny? I, I, that's going to be the question of the season, ultimately. Like, there's going to be a point where I think Porzingis is going to have to close the gap in shots per game. You're going to, like you said, Derek White's had some moments. Drew Holiday's going to take plenty of shots as well. So I would expect at some point Jalen's 17.8 shots per game comes down. How much does he want to do that? I mean, like sometimes with some of the shots he takes, doesn't it feel like he's trying to prove that he deserves the 300 million instead of just doing what is ultimately best for the for the team? Like he had that shot the other night, obviously, the one that everybody was talking about, the three. Porzingis is pretty open in the paint didn't pretty find open him. he was wide open wide, wide open i mean the, like it's, the, hor- the charlotte <laughs> announcers are like oh my god he had porzingis <laughs> i mean like moments like that that's where like i i'd struggle to say it's because he's trying to prove himself when he's always had moments of tunnel vision and he misses guys jalen brown has always been somebody who scores and isn't somebody who elevates his teammates that's why i think you know like yes maybe you could ask he could you know have a bigger star star role on another team is this the best for him that's what you said earlier in, in a way i think it is because this is where he doesn't have that pressure to be the guy because i don't think jalen brown is the guy who elevates all of his teammates he's not the playmaker he's not the guy who's a shot creator and with yeah. this team the way it's constructed there's flaws in terms of like them getting to the rim, getting to the free throw line. They don't roll the basket. They're bottom 10 and, you know, getting to the basket. With Jalen, it's it's a offense where everybody shares that creation load. I don't think it would be good for Jalen if he were the, if it were all on him to do that. Well, you know what that looks in like? The future. It ends up looking like the Chicago Bulls and yeah. a couple of these other teams we have where it's like, all right, Zach Levine's your best player. Where are you going? Winning is the for the best for him. The that, that, like this is what's best for him. So it's really about th- this is where the Celtics need to figure out, sp- uh, particularly Jalen Brown, considering all the talent that's around him now. What is my place in the team, and what are the things that I can do that leads us to winning a championship? And taking 18 shots per game, there will be nights that he should be taking 18, 19, 20 plus shots per game. But there's going to be a lot of nights where I think his best role is going to be 10, 11, 12 shots per game and shooting more spot-up three-pointers. Because I think with them, like, at the beginning of the season, there were some times Jalen would dribble the ball up the floor and back his man down into post-ups, inefficient looks. That's not his game. And I, I think with him, I would like to see Boston, again, like, to me, this is all about Porzingis here. With the, the Jalen frustration that some Celtics fans are feeling right now, it's because of the other option in Chris Tapp's Porzingis. Porzingis is one of the, the league's most efficient post scores going back to last season. Yeah. Like, like you heard me on Verno with the podcast earlier this year, the year he had with the Wizards. Nobody's watching the Wizards. It could be a good stats, you know, bad team type of situation. But Porzingis looked like an improved guy last year with Washington. It's carrying over this year with Boston where he is just beaten up smaller guys when they switch on post-ups. And I don't think the Celtics are finding him enough. There was a play against the Grizzlies on, what, Sunday, Saturday, whatever night that game Sunday was. Night, yeah. Sunday night, And like I think it was John Conchar got switched onto Porzingis. Porzingis has like a foot on him. And meanwhile, Drew Holiday had an ISO against Jaron Jackson Jr. Like, why is Drew Holiday taking a contested ISO jumper against Jaron Jackson Jr. when Porzingis has amazing post positioning on Conchar. So I think the Celtics collectively need to figure out how do we get Porzingis more than just 12 shots per game because he's been that good going back to last season, and I would like to see his usage tick up over the course of the year. Yeah, and some of this is this. we have only a few weeks into this season. Mm -hmm. 40% of the starting five is new. These guys are all trying to figure it out. And that's why... This is not a, uh oh, the Jalen Brown thing is not working out. This is just like, this is a discussion. I think anybody who watches the Celtics all the time, it's the number one thing people are talking about. How is he going to tweak his game to fit into this embarrassment of riches where, you know, there's moments where if the other team's guards suck, White and Holiday can just dominate a game or they can dominate a half. If Tatum's feeling it like he was in Charlotte last night, you kind of have to ride that. I think the thing, the thing that surprised me with Jalen, because I I really like Jalen. Like I I have actually I've been I've been defending him in some of these cases. The 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 Miami series was indefensible. He was terrible. But I think for the most part, he's got some faults the same way some other great players does. But he brings so much else to the table that you're willing to forgive some of the stuff where it's like oh, I wish he wouldn't do that. You know, like the if Westbrook's the 
number one person of all time like that. Jalen's, you know, he's below, but he's not that far below. We're like, oh man, oh, he's going to do the thing <laughs> where he tries to dribble through five guys. Don't do that, Jalen. Come on, you're going to lose the ball. But I think he plays hard. I think he's unafraid. Um, he certainly has the confidence of somebody who's been in 105 playoff games and some real wars already and had to guard people like LeBron and Jimmy Butler, people like that. What's interesting about the situation he's in now is he's in this role that I think Chris Bosh got was in with Miami. You know, we've mm. seen it over the years. Doc Rivers talked about it on my podcast last week where it's like, it's actually better for the team if you double down on the defense, on the little stuff, maybe take some, for, drop down to 14 shots and become more of an all-around guy. That's going to be more impactful. We have a big enough sample size, KOC. He's not in most of the best lineups this team has had. And it's it's pretty eye-opening. Like, Brian Barrett had some stats about when uh, when he's on the court, he got this from cleaning the glass, they're plus 7.4 net. And when he's off the court, they're plus 16.4. It's it's not a giant difference, but it's not nothing either. Um, when he's just this year, he's shooting forty four point eight percent from the field, but he's fifty two percent point two percent on twos, which is eighty third in the league. At the rim, he's thirty eight for sixty eight, which is the twenty eighth percentile. And then the minutes when Tatum isn't out there, the team's minus. They have a one hundred eight rating, and Barrett said only three teams were south of that this season. There's also some usage rate stuff with him. So 29 players in the league have a 28 usage rate or higher. Only 29. We have a 30 mm -hmm. team league. He's got the third lowest assist percentage behind Wemby and Cam Thomas. Wow. Not sure that's wow. the company you want to be in. <laughs> He's 23rd in true shooting out of the 29. And um, just for per 36, he's 119th in assists. So what we're getting is like, this guy who really should be the do it all glue guy, kind of what he was in the end of the 2010s, where it's like, I'll, I'll just do everything else. I'm here to help. But he doesn't seem to think that that's who he is. And how that tug of war with him in Missoula and the rest of the lineup and the better options they have, how he kind of figures out his place to me is the ceiling of this team. Even more so than Tatum reaching an even higher level. You think Jalen Brown is going to be that X factor I in do. the postseason? I because I still think Tatum is probably a year away from being the guy that he's ultimately going to be. Because this year the big difference was he got stronger. And when you talked about Porzingis punishing smaller people, Tatum can do that too. And they have this superpower that they did not have last year, where if you go smaller against them, they're going to find a matchup and and beat you in the paint and get a ten footer, an eight footer, or a six footer with either Tatum or Porzingis against a smaller guy. Last year, remember, it was Horford was basically the guy they would do that with. I know that the results were mixed. So they have that. And they also have Drew has like, I'd kind of forgotten. He's got this crafty, herky-jerky post-up game he can go to sometimes. So they have ways, depending on who you're throwing at them, to punish them. But then you see last night, it's like, why weren't they attacking LaMelo in the fourth quarter and in overtime? That guy can't guard anybody, you know? I know he guarded Halliburton on that one play, but that that's just somebody like I would want to be attacking whoever he's on. Um, but the, with the Jalen thing, it's just not the best matchup most of the time. And I think he might be one of the last ones to realize that is the fear I have with the, with the X factor piece. Is there a point where, I mean, even if he doesn't realize it, that he could be forced into that type of role? I mean, like it, could there be situations that come this season? Like, yeah, Boston's been one of the best teams in the league, but there probably will be a moment that, Missoula doesn't have him on the floor in a big moment because he's riding one of those great lineups that you're talking about where it's featuring role players. And, and I think with Jalen, there could come a moment where that happens where then it like Celtics win the game. It becomes an even bigger conversation. And like we're on this podcast again talking about, well, where's Jalen's place? With Jalen, it might be his choice, but it could also be the team saying, hey, like this is what we need from you. We like this has been your yeah. role in recent years, but. Look at past championship teams. Like you mentioned Chris Bosch, that Doc on, like Ray Allen sacrifices. Clay like Thompson. Pierce. Clay, Clay Thompson, Thompson during the Durant years. He sacrificed a 100%. shitload. He took three, four less shots a game. And ultimately, that's what 
leads to winning? What is best for the team? If, if taking, you know, 13, 14 shots instead of 18, 19, 20 plus like last season is what leads the team to winning a championship, then, then you got to do it. And with Boston, like you got to look around that locker room and see the amount of talent that's around you, whether it's obviously Tatum who's the best player on the team, but KP, Drew, Derek White, other guys that can have like hot shooting nights where maybe just the ball finds them more often. With Jalen, yeah. we we saw him, like you said, the late 2010s when he was younger in his career, pre-All-Star. He could lock in more often and do some of that stuff on defense. He became a better spot-up shooter. He was a 40% guy off the catch right. for two or three straight seasons, and he hasn't been for, I think, since 2021. So like if he if he can get the catch and shoot three point number back up to 40 percent, that gives him more value, even when he's not running pick and roll or not isolating. So with Jalen, like he's like, I think with the Boston, like we're nitpicking because this is what you do with championship contenders. Like you find what is the weak spot? What could hold them back? What do they need to solve? And well, with, and a guy who signed a three hundred four million dollar yes. contract. Like <laughs> we're nitpicking because he has a huge salary cap figure, and that's just a fact for sure. And if they fall short this year, he's the guy that they probably move next summer. I think so that's he, fair. Yeah. Hey, listen, the Red Sox sucked. The Patriots have been an absolute abomination. So the Celtics have. Yeah, the Bruins are doing well, but for me personally, like I, I I'm more into the Celtics season than than I normally would be because the Pats have been so sad. And we've also been watching Jalen now since 2016. And when you are when you spend that much time with a player just day in, day out, you kind of get to know after a while, all right, he's going to do this or oh, this is going to happen. <laughs> and one thing with Jalen this year, if he doesn't get the ball for three, four minutes, it's going up. And you just know it. You know it sitting on the couch watching the TV being 2,000 miles away from wherever the game is. It's like, he'll get the ball over half court and it's like, oh, he's shooting this. It's he, he hasn't had one for a while. Now Tatum, same thing, but Tatum's a better offensive player. I it just feels like there's been some which started last year, because he took 21 shots a game last year, 20.6, something like that. So it, it was happening last year too. But it made more sense last year because they didn't have Porzingis. They didn't have Drew Holiday. Um, Smart was, you know, always going to be the inferior offensive player in the team. Now Jalen's the the, in my opinion, the fifth the fifth option if I really need a basket against a good team. And we, like that Minnesota game was a really good example. There's just not good options for against, if they're guarding him with McDaniels or, or Edwards, who's invested in actually playing, trying to play defense with those guys, with Gobert protecting the rim, Jalen's not necessarily the best matchup for us in that game. You know, and, and whether the light bulb goes off with him or not, I just don't know. I don't, he, he, he when you're 27 as an NBA player, you kind of are who you are. It's not a lot of, not a lot of change, not a lot of growth at that point. So this, this might be who he is. So do you at all, do you all at all worry about, like, I think these last two games against Memphis and Charlotte, the inability to get to the basket with any consistency. I mentioned earlier, like their bottom 10 and free throw rate, bottom 10 and ad room shots. You're talking bottom, the whole team. The whole team, like even bottom yeah. 10 and for, for that matter in consecutive years now at like when you set a pick and roll, rolling to the basket, it's a team that pops. Even Porzingis, like Porzingis can shoot off the catch, pick and pop and all that. But I think getting to the rim more often would be nice to see them experiment with over the course of the season, forcing some of those at rim shots well, instead of driving kick, forcing some of those rolls to the basket with poor Zingis, try to get some lob opportunities. He can finish off one or two bounces as well on his way to the basket. I just, I'd like to see that because we know the team is good. We know they're going to be in the playoffs. I, I'd just like to see them add that, you know, wrinkle to their offense. Just like you're talking about the post ups earlier. That's a yeah. great addition. It's awesome to have that with poor Zingis and Tatum. But I think a little bit more rim attacking would be, Something that uh, Joe Mazzola should look at over the course of the season, too. Well, they're 11 and three. We mentioned the Philly loss. Philly outplayed them that game, but they still had a chance to tie it. Porzingis missed a three that could have sent it to overtime. They lost to Minnesota in overtime in a game that they had the ball. The Charlotte loss yesterday was disgusting, but it was also no Derek White, and it's, you know, Thanksgiving week. You can't totally overreact. I The thing that has shocked me over everything else with what you're talking about or like, do they get to the line enough? And I, I just can't believe how good Porzingis is. And, and I don't know if it's just because certain guys on a team with an embarrassment of riches, it actually makes them better because all he's doing is shooting wide open threes. And then if somebody puts a small on him, 
he's got he's either trying to post that person up or they're trying to throw lobs to him and he's super happy it doesn't even feel like he's necessarily breaking a sweat in some of these games he's just kind of jogging around with this big smile on his face and his rim protection which we knew was kind of the sneaky piece of the Porzingis package I think has been pretty good but he's also not a huge foul shot guy so it's going to be Tatum or it's going to be the guards but I, I guess my fear with this team is it's like in football when you have the team that's throwing in the first two months of the season, like a Miami, it's like, ah, oh, this looks great in October when it's 75 degrees, but can you audible when we get to December, January, can you start running the ball? Can you start winning 17, 14 games? I do worry about with this team a little bit when things really slow down, is it just going to be guys jacking up threes and not actually trying to run offense? You know, I just, does, what Denver can do when Murray's back is the cheat code in the league right now. And I do you feel like Boston has anything like that? Because I do not. No, they don't have that two-man game. Like, that. that's unstoppable. There's nothing you can do about Jokic and Murray or even, like, Jokic and MPJ or Jokic right. and whoever you plug and play with him. It doesn't matter. <laughs> He's the doesn't cheat matter. code in the half court. And, and Boston, it still feels like there's going to be stretches where... And, and that's why I want to see them do a little bit more, you know, wrinkles with pick and roll and just see how it looks over the course of the season and roll into the basket. But that's not a, that's not a cheat code either. They, yeah. they just don't have that. Um, so that, so that, that's we, why they're, they're not on the level of Denver, in my opinion. They're a tick below. Yeah, and, and Denver, Murray's been out, and now Denver's like, oh, somebody beat Denver here. Whoa, what is it? It's, Denver's the best team in the league. And um, the, all that's happening now without Murray is their young guys are getting more experience that they're going to need more. But Jokic is... There's n- nothing like him until until uh, Sengun <laughs> replaces him as Jokic 2.0, which is <laughs> might be happening faster than uh, we anticipated. If I had to rank my Celtics, uh, things I'm worried about the most, to me, it's still Porzingis getting nine months out of him as number one because you just have to look at his game logs and basketball reference and his injury history and... You know, I just think every day that he's out there and healthy and happy and smiling is a huge win for the Celtics. That would be one. Number two would be, I still feel like there are guys short and I wish they had one more guard with size that, you know, in that in certain games against long, big teams, like that Minnesota team, that they had somebody else with some, somebody between 6'4 and 6'6 six, six, who is either a two guard or a three or even a point guard um, like in Austin, even if it was Austin Rivers, who I've been hoping they've signed for two months, not just because he's at the ringer. I thought he had good moments <laughs> in Minnesota last year, but one other person that gives them mm-hmm. protection against bigger teams. And then the third thing is this Jalen thing. And is he going to accept the Chris Bosh piece of this, or is this just who he is the rest of the season? 